Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine. This is Sleepy Time Tea from Celestial Seasonings, a classic. I just felt like a nice relaxing tea. No, nothing more than that. This is also a recent acquisition of mine. Um, and it, it is kind of funny because it's called Mr. Darcy, so obviously wouldn't hurt to use uh, for Jane Austen July, which is coming up pretty soon. But of course I was uh, drawn to it because it looks so much like my cat Zenobia that I lost last month. Not exactly. I don't think it's a Persian or it might be. I'm not sure. But either way, it just kind of did resemble her. So I thought a little tribute, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay with all that, but it's still, still kind of sad. Anyway, um, but I've been reading and so I thought I would do a mid-month wrap-up. It's a little late for that, but who cares? <laughs> you know, we can go off schedule a little bit, right? Uh, so I finished four books so far this month, and I'm stuck in the middle of a lot of others. Been working on that um, Midsummer Night's Cleanup project that I had, which was basically to go through, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> to go through my uh, currently reading, especially especially those books on Goodreads, and to bring it down which I really haven't done very well. It doesn't mean I haven't been reading things. I did finish one book from there that had been there for a while, and I picked up a few other books and continued them. So it's not like I didn't make progress, but not the dramatic progress I would have liked to have made by now. But I'm not going to kick myself for it. One of the things I have to think about is I haven't seen a change in the grace period that the public library has given for a while, which is basically if you check out a book and you don't return it on time and you can't renew it and it's overdue, they're not going to charge you. It'll say overdue when you check it on it online, but you don't have to pay a fine. And I know that they're doing that so that you didn't have to worry about getting into the city or getting into anywhere because they opened up a number of branches, but a lot of them are spaced out to the point that even if it's in, you know, your neighborhood, it's still maybe not your local ones. You may not be able to get to it very often. But I think that this time it could be it. And I don't blame them because a lot more people are, you know, getting back to life. New York is considered open at this point. Uh, so, I mean, no excuse at this point, but I would love it if they just gave us another three months. I mean, just after Labor Day, come on. But I can't, I can't do anything about that. So I have so many books that suddenly I want to read and I can't renew them. So I really do have until the end of the month before I start having to pay for them. And that takes away the whole point of taking books out of the library. <sighs> so we'll see. But the, the books that I finished, most of them... Well, only one of them is actually a new book. Uh, and, but two of them are library books. That's good. Um, but let me start with, uh, I'll just uh, start with just another, uh, pro not project, but a challenge, etc. And that was the, I think it's called Ancient, Ancient Sathon, blanking out. Um, but it's, it's a fun thing, uh, reading books before um, the year 1700. And I think that uh, I would have loved to have just really gone all the way with that. But I also said, as I said in my uh, TBR, that let me just keep it simple and pick one book new, not new, obviously, but you know, new to me, haven't read it yet. And then maybe continue with um, the Dante, which I have been doing terrible with, but we'll see with that. Um, seriously. <laughs> But I picked a book that wasn't very long because I said, look, this will make it simple, but it's a book that I've been wanting to read for a long time. <clears throat> <clears throat> I am allergic to pressure. And uh, so I picked Madame de Lafayette, the Princess de Cleves, and that's how I'm going to say it this time because I know it's French, but if it were, why wouldn't it say Le? 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 Princess? Is it Le? La? Wait. I'm forgetting my French, but you know what I mean. Why would it say the? I don't get it. So anyway, this was uh, published in 1678. So it just makes it by like, what, 22 years, I think, before 1700. So that's not bad. It's, yeah, it, it is just like on the border there, but it is kind of a historical novel and it's considered the first French novel. It's not that big. And it takes place in 
what would be in England, the Tudor era, wherein um, Queen Elizabeth I just became the queen. So uh, there are a couple of people who are kind of fictional characters. I think this the main character and a couple of the people are fictional, but they they exist in actual you know society of people. So it starts out just naming all kinds of names, just people all over the place. A lot of people who sound vaguely familiar if you are someone who has read any history of England or France. Because if you read history of England during that time, they of course had, you know, transactions of many kinds with the French. So you may have heard certain names just by default. And, um, and if you've read anything about French history, you'll, de you'll definitely recognize these names. The problem is that so many of the names, if you're not, you know, if you don't speak French and you're not extremely an expert, it can get a little confusing and it can get a little overwhelming. Not as badly as I think War and Peace did for me, because it's like so many different versions of a name based on, you know, so many different versions. Uh, but still, still it's a lot of names to get used to, so it takes a while to settle in. And then <clears throat> for a book that was 182 pages, it sure, yeah, it sure went on, actually less than that, it sure felt like it took a while. Um, once it got into the story, it was pretty good. It's about a woman, a girl, woman, whatever, who um, marries a man who loves her very much and they're all you know high up in court and everything um, but she finds herself attracted to someone else who is also attracted to her so it's a constant battle of you know should I give in to this but I really know better than that but you know then there's all kinds of like little intrigue court intrigues and this person trying to see her and they keep running into each other and so it's a struggle it's like both a moral struggle and a i don't know court struggle i don't know if you could call that in general because of course there's gossip everywhere and um our main character um princess of the cleaves that's who she becomes um she which i don't understand how that factors in but uh she is close to the um i think they call it the dauphine which is like the the crown prince's wife, uh, who happens to be Mary Queen of Scots, so she's also a queen. And so she's she's in here a lot. And in fact, there's a whole part where she's telling the story about Henry VIII and his wives and everything. And it's a slightly skewed point of view, but it but it's kind of funny. Like what would it what would have been like for someone like her to have told that story? And little does she know how much of a part how much of that story she's going to come a part of. My goodness, you know the. Uh, once she uh, goes back to Scotland. Whew. But anyway, that's another story for another time. That doesn't really get in here. Her um, mother-in-law is Catherine de' Medici. There's, you know, obviously they don't really like each other that much. And there's like these letters that get, you know, lost and in the wrong hands that people think it's from this person, from that person. So it's kind of like, I wouldn't say a soap opera, but it's kind of fun to see not mm, a little bit misunderstanding-ish stuff. Uh, I, I always compare anything that happens with misunderstandings. It's like always to me a combination of Shakespeare and Thomas Hardy because you know things are going to go wrong if, you know, if people would just talk to each other. But that's, I guess that's the whole idea of conflict in fiction, right? Miscommunications and everything. So it was well done, I think, but I wasn't enthralled by it. I would say if you are interested in just novels in general and historical fiction in general and you would like to just be complete and everything it's not bad i just it felt like it took longer to read than i wanted it to and it was a little dramatic at times where it didn't need to be i was like are you kidding this person got upset about something and they got sick and died i'm not gonna say who but you know it's like it happens too often it it, it was like and not always women either i mean <laughs> <laughs> Some of the men in this book are like super drama queens. I don't, anyway, that sounds judgmental, but you know, <laughs> it, was, it was just kind of fun. But, but it, what it did for me was make me remember how little I've been reading French novels lately. So I think that's why it felt, um, you know, like something I wasn't used to anymore. And the funny thing is when I was 
getting into reading classics on my own. You know, not through school or whatever, and not kids' classics or whatever. Most of what I read was French novels. I mean, just because I, well, mainly because I first got into like musicals and a couple of them were based on French novels, so I wanted to read the source. And then I got into other ones, and then I got into Jane Austen and Victorian novels, of, you know, Victorian England novels and stuff. So, I mean, it really is a part of me, you know, reading, reading uh, French fiction, but I don't know what happened that I've been separated for that, which is not entirely true. I also have to finish The Count of Monte Cristo. I don't know why I haven't continued with that, because it was really good. But like I said, we're going to have to do this Midsummer Night's clean up probably for the rest of the year. So it's going to be like mid-autumn and mid-November. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. I met, I showed this book. I was reading it. Uh, um, I started it in May and then I finished it not too long ago. Um, How to Be Human, An Autistic Man's Guide to Life by Jory Fleming. This is a pretty new book. Um, and Jory Fleming spends time I mean, with Lyric Winnick, who asks him questions about his life. He uh, got a Rhodes Scholarship, which is how to explain it. Um, I think it's just for Americans. It's a scholarship to go to Oxford. It That's kind of cool. Um, I, I know there's at least one president who had that opportunity, but, um, but I'm not going to get into that because I don't know everything about it. But it, this was considered a big deal because um, uh, Jory Fleming is autistic and had started out being kind of nonverbal and needed certain kinds of support. Also had a lot of health issues that weren't just related to being autistic, just health issues in general. So he did have to overcome a lot of difficulties to be able to be in this position at all. So this is kind of like, it's not exactly an interview, it's just really, but in a way it is because it's questions about how he views life and emotions and how it affects him and how it doesn't affect him and why do people get involved in this and why do people do this and how he handles things that other people would consider difficult or easy or whatever and he seems pretty chill which is nice um and it is just a different it's a different point of view even when they ask him you know dealing with other people who are autistic and he, Basically, everybody is as different as everybody else to each other. So that's why I think it's a recommendable book to read if you're interested at all in understanding neurodivergence because um, there is no one type of autism. I kind of... Did I mention this last time I talked about this book? I, don't, I feel like I'm deja vuing. But I, I, I feel like it's almost like the Myers-Briggs you know, how, um, if you've ever looked into Myers-Briggs, how there's like 16 personality types based on your functions and what your, are your superior functions and what are your inferior functions they are stacked together and they come out with different things. Usually when I take that test, I come out INFP, which I'm not going to explain right now, but if you were into that whole thing, you would say, oh yeah, yeah, that. But, um, introverted, you know, intuitive feeler perceiver, I think is what it's called. But basically, I keep saying basically, it really means that you there is no better or worse um, type of personality. It really is how you um, approach somebody. So if I don't think that the Myers Briggs thing is a perfect science at all, um, if you read into it all the history behind it, you would understand that too. It's 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 there. It, it, it's helpful, but it's I wouldn't like use it as a bible, you know. To, but it does help in a way to deal with people because if you understand that people may react to certain things a different way, you may realize that you don't, you know, no one person is exactly the same. And I almost think that would be helpful with, for instance, autism. People think of autism, they think of one kind of thing usually. But if you understand the whole deal of the spectrum, it's not very autistic and not very autistic, but kind of autistic, you know, it is, it is like um, autistic, but you know, verbal and autistic, nonverbal, autistic with executive functions and autistic with poor executive functioning, autistic with sensory issues, autistic with fewer sensory issues, that kind of thing. And I wish that there was a way, and I know this is probably someone has thought of this 
first, but I wish there was a way to almost Myers-Briggs that um, in a way, because that would help people to first of all understand that no two autistic people uh, function the same and need the same exact kind of support, um, but that they all need some kind of support and some, and some, or understanding, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's hard to explain. Anyway, so I just think that if, if you're curious about autism, this is not a bad book to read, but it, to me, it should be one book among many. Um, definitely seek out memoirs from autistic persons about their lives and you will find that every single one is different. Um, so yeah, <laughs> anyway, so, um, then one of the books that I had been reading for a while and that was on my um, Goodreads currently reading and I said why am I not finishing this book and I know why I'm not finishing it. it's because I had just a million books to read that I'm they're that all good and that is a uh, modern tea a fresh look at an ancient beverage by Lisa Boalt Bolt Richardson once again I should have looked that up but anyway Richardson is easy to say um and it is a really good book for um anyone who doesn't know that much about tea but wouldn't mind learning a little bit about history the different kinds of teas how it's prepared how you do pairings how you do tastings etc and also resources i know nowadays we use the internet to look up resources when i was first getting into tea as a teenager teenager uh, um we didn't really have internet I know it sounds like, you know, we used to have to walk five miles to school in the snow with no shoes on and, you know, no breakfast or whatever. But, um, I mean, I, internet, I think might have existed in its earlier forms when I was a teenager, but most of us did not sit down and Google. Well, I don't think Google existed yet. Anyway, let's not talk about how old I am. Um, but I used to either check books out of the library or buy tea books, books about tea, um, my tea libraries down here. I do intend to come with some system to have a separate tea library, but we'll get there. Um, but in the end of most of the books, there is usually a, a resources section, which tells you places to buy teas. It's kind of sad when you see it from the older books, because half of those places are gone and long gone, you know, tea rooms, tea, you know, restaurants and stuff like that, and shops that you could buy teas at places that had catalogs a lot of them don't exist anymore because that's how life is businesses you know open and close and that's it people you know die you know okay I'm really depressing now but but still it's kind of it's still kind of cool to see the history of the resources but this is pretty recent so even though things go out of date very quickly this was written in give me a moment I knew it okay um Oh my, where is the copyright? 2014. So it's been, you know, less than 10 years ago. So we have resources in North America, United Kingdom, and France, which I know. But I guess this is where the target audience is. But, um, so that's kind of cool. The, the, the one in the United Kingdom postcard tees, I remember that place. I passed by it. But anyway, um, and there's a couple of places here that I've actually been to in North America as well, or ordered from whatever. And I love the naked hardback. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, I wish more hardbacks would be like that. I know Dust Shack is a kind of nice, but when they have the one stuck on, really. But anyway, yes. Um, I don't know if this would be the only book I would buy if I could only have one book about tea, but it wouldn't be the worst one to have. So yeah, if you're looking for one, it's not it's not an incredibly expensive book. It's easy to find. I think I had I think I found this on Hamilton Books which is a pretty inexpensive um, website for books. Uh, really recommendable because they, they do have a good variety of, of fiction and nonfiction. But anyway, it's not an ad. Last but not least is a book that I took out of the library last November and finally finished it. It wasn't because I, it was a bad book, but once again, I just had a lot of books going on. And this is Around the World in 80 Trains by Monisha Rajesh. And um, she is a journalist, I think, and she, yeah, and she did another book before this, which I wouldn't mind reading, called Around India, I think, in 80 Trains, which would be interesting. I've never been to India, and I've definitely never been in a train in India, um, 
and I hear it's it's a story in itself. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite Bollywood uh, performances ever was from uh, was train related from the movie Dilse. I don't know if any of you watch Bollywood movies. I know my sister does, obviously, but um, <laughs> it's uh, the 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 actor um, Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, who was like the biggest Bollywood actor ever, and he's still pretty big, um, or one of the biggest. And there's a whole scene where he dances on top of this train with a whole bunch of other people, and it's just really cool. <laughs> and it just, um, I don't know why I thought of that now, oh, because I was thinking of Indian trains, but I know that's not what this book is about. Just side point, if you ever, um, oh, I don't know how to, Maybe maybe I'll remember to link it down below. Uh, it's called Chea Chea. It's a it's a um, it's great it's a great song. It's a great um, performance. <laughs> anyway, oh man, I haven't seen a Bollywood movie in so long. Uh, well, no, I did see one not long ago. I watched clips of it anyway. But so this is this is not the entire world. Most of this is um, the northern hemisphere. So she starts out in leaving, I guess, from London because that's where she is from she's from England um and she and her fiance take off a bunch of time and they travel as light as possible and they travel you know through Europe to Russia to I don't remember the exact the, the problem is unless I'm missing something I don't see a map in here and I really think this book would have benefited from a map and I think every chapter should have had either a map or at least like a line of where they travel to. But she, yeah, so she travels through a bunch of Asia. And then I was a little disappointed in a way, because I really thought that it was going to be only train travel. I mean, I'm not saying if she was in the city, she might take like, you know, a cab or something around the city. But I mean, to go from country to country, I thought it was going to be strictly by um, train. However, it wasn't. It, uh, at one point, she ends up taking a train to, I mean, a, the plane to, I think, Seattle, or I think so. And then, you know, from Asia, all the way over <laughs> the Pacific Ocean, and then taking a train through Canada, and then down to, uh, you know, Northeast United States. She does stop in New York briefly. Um, She's a celebrity that I saw once, so, you know, small world. Travels down to the south and, and back again. I don't know. I don't know the exact route because they didn't, you know, write it down. Um, you have to figure it out for yourself. And then she flies back, goes to um, North Korea and also Tibet. So there's a lot of places that are featured here that aren't, like, they're quite off the beaten track. So that's what I found pretty cool. Um... I almost think it was just too much. I don't know. So much traveling and so many different things to get used to. But then some places are just covered in a blink and some places take a while. Some things I related to very much so like in certain areas when they were traveling through, um, she was having difficulties because you're not supposed to smoke in the trains and people were and it was really bothering her lungs. And I was like, oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> So you know, I have to deal with these kind of things. Um, but getting used to every country has a different way. Like this, the trains are different. Although she didn't describe every train exactly which ones they were. Um, well, she's not all about the whole mechanics of it, really. She's more about the journey and, and, you know, and the people she meets, which is really cool. She does meet a lot of different people and talks to them. And just, you know, different, I don't like to use the word culture shock, but something along those lines, just different, different, getting used to different ways and, you know, different types of uh, dining arrangements, that sort of thing. Just how people share space together or don't share space together. And yeah, and I liked it. I really did because it also mixed some history with it. Like when she was in Japan, she, she went to Hiroshima and, you know, there was a little bit of uh, memorializing there and people that she talked to and there was a person that she um, uh, uh, that she had met that she had the book that actually died in the process of making this uh, book that had had quite an experience as a prisoner of war um, in World War Two of the um, Japanese so it's it there are a lot of stories in this book that are, are amazing almost made me want to do a massive train trip probably can never do so because 
I don't have that time. I don't have probably the health for it um, or any other resources really. But you know, it makes me think about just at least occasionally going on trains a little more. I do like trains, but I just can't do it as often as I like. And I'm not counting the subway in that. <laughs> so that was a pretty, it's a pretty good book. It wasn't perfect to me. But I think if you feel like doing a bit of armchair traveling, it could be an exciting uh, book for you. So yeah, so it was a pretty good, it was a pretty good uh, month so far. Nothing completely blew me away, I should say, but got some time left to this month so we'll see and if all fails I have you know Jane Austen to contend with to look forward to so that'll be successful no matter what so let me know if you've read any of these books what you think how your month's going so far I keep holding up this mug <laughs> but it's cute and my cat Freddy's coming in here telling me he's hungry so uh, I think we'll call it a day this is Catherine taking tea with Catherine have a lovely tea and book fill day bye